Thank you, Candice, for being here all the way from Minneapolis. Candice is a mom of five. She's married to Paul, and her oldest daughter, Lola, is with her tonight. And we are just honored to have her come. She spoke last Mother's Day, and was if you guys were able to be here, you can find that online. And I'm so thrilled that she's here. She just has a word that God has been unfolding and unpacking in her life that she's going to share with you. And she can tell you a little bit more about who she is. So Candice, would you come? Would you guys give her a hand as she comes? Hello, ladies. So good to be with you. I love being in a room of women. No offense to all the males here who are helping and serving, but just being with a group of women is just so special and so intimate, and I'm just grateful that you gave up a Friday night to be here together. Um, I just want to just thank Amber and her team for asking me back. It's such an honor to get to be here for your very first sisterhood night. How exciting is that, that this is not just a one-time event, but this will be ongoing. I love that for Weatherstone. And um, so, yeah, I'm just super grateful to get to be here and to bring my daughter with me. It's um, so special. Well, I'll just for those of you who were not here last Mother's Day, just give you a quick little snippet of my family. I'm just going to show you a picture of us around Christmas time. Um, that is us. There are seven of us, and my husband Paul and I have been married about 18 years, and we have five kiddos. We have Lola, who's our oldest. She's 16. And then our son Justice is 13. He's a seventh grader in middle school. And we have our daughters, uh, Nia and Winnie, who are seven and six. And then our son Moses, who is two and a half. He'll be three in just a few weeks. So those are our babies. And we actually, for a stint, we lived in Texas over a decade ago. My husband and I pastored there. And that's where our son Justice was born. And when we moved back to the Twin Cities, we were, our, our family was young and small. Lola was six, Justice was two. And we just thought, you know what, let's just have fun for a year. We're just going to find a cool place to live. And we found this loft that was just about six blocks from downtown, from the skyline. And we could walk everywhere. We biked everywhere. We just, we loved it. We were kind of on top of each other because it was a small space. Um, but it was fun for about a year. And then we thought, all right, it's time for the kids to get a yard, a little more space to roam around. And so we went on a six-month house hunt. Now, if anybody has ever transitioned and looked for a house, you know, sometimes you can find that house right away. And other times it just drags on and on. And for us, this was a long process. And I remember we walked into a short sale it's a home that was right across from one of the lakes in Minneapolis called Lake Nokomis. And the layout was great. The view was beautiful. But they were asking quite a bit. So we thought, let's just lowball it. Let's just see what happens. We're just going to throw out a price and just sit on it for a while. And short sales can take a really long time. So we just let that go. We kept searching. And we came across another small home, a foreclosure, great price on a main thoroughway in Minneapolis called Portland Avenue. And we loved it. Um, we put an offer in that night. A few days later, we got the call that our offer was accepted. But we also got a call within an hour, an hour. We had waited weeks and weeks and weeks for this lake house. And we get a call the same day saying, congratulations, you got this house too. And so then we had a decision to make. We thought, all right. We either take the Portland house or the lake house. But I'm going to put a pause on the story and just back us up about a month. So at the time, God was really talking to my husband and I about pursuing the kingdom of God and not the American dream, which was kind of frustrating, right? Because we wanted the idyllic neighborhood. We wanted the cul-de-sac life. We wanted our kids to bike around the neighborhood and everything to be safe. But God was really challenging us, like, hey, hey, why don't you just take some time and just pray and just seek me about where you guys should live, because I might have something to say about it. And so we did. We said, all right, God, we're going to kind of be open-handed here. We're just going to surrender to this process. And so when we saw that little house on Portland, at the top of the stairs, there was a small bedroom, about six foot by five foot. So I mean real small. And it had a little window. 
And we came home the night of putting our offer in, and I was dancing with Lola, actually, to some old school Fred Hammond music. And while we were dancing together, I just started crying. And I had this picture pop into my mind that it could have been the Lord, I, meant, I would assume, because it's nothing I could have really come up with on my own. But in that little room at the top of the stairs, I saw a crib, and I saw an infant that we would foster. So I'm bawling here, and I'm trying to explain to my little girl like, why mommy's so sad when we're having so much fun. And later that night, I shared that with Paul, and I said, hey, uh, we put this offer in, and I think we're going to get the house, and I think this is what's going to happen in that little room upstairs. And I remember Paul thinking, okay, all right, let's just see what happens. So sure enough, when they accepted our offer, it was an obvious choice for us. We knew that day, like, oh man, that lake house is dangling right in front of our face, but no, God is telling us this is our house. Well, a week after we accepted, there was graffiti all over the side of the garage. And my husband looked at me as we drove through the alley, and he put his hand on my lap, and I said, it's okay, it's okay, this is our house. We had decided we're going to we're going to be people who are present in this neighborhood. We are going to be people of peace in this neighborhood, and we're going to be people who pray. And if there's purpose here, graffiti, it's okay. Like, we can do this. About a month after we moved into this home, there were a couple 15-passenger vans that were behind the apartment next door. And I remember seeing those vans come and go early in the morning or late at night, and I thought it was kind of odd. And we had been trying to meet some neighbors, so my kids and I baked some muffins. We wrote a little note, just said, hey, we're new to the neighborhood. And the next day, I get a letter back with the letterhead of this organization, and it said, wow, thank you so much for your kindness, and it's kind of uncommon because we are actually a halfway home for men who have committed pedophilia. And I read the letter, and as I'm reading, I honestly started laughing out loud. And I was like, God, okay. Like, there is purpose here. You have called us to be people who are present, people of peace, and people who pray. And let me tell you, I was their greatest intercessor for five years while we lived in that home. And just being able to pray for these men as they come go, like, God, break the chains in their lives. Let them just restore their innocence, the innocence of their victims. And it was just an opportunity to get to pray. And we, sure enough, we fostered and adopted two little girls in that home. Our first placement was an infant baby girl who slept in a crib at the top of the stairs for 18 months. Well, after about five years, we thought, all right, let's transition. Let's try the north side of Minneapolis. And so my husband and I, we went looking and found this new construction, this home that was kind of unheard of on the north side. A lot of really old homes, but this one was brand new. So we got excited. And it's situated between an apartment and an Asian media studio. And I think we have a photo of my view from the dining room. There is a mural along one whole side of this art studio, which can best be described as the Greek gods. <laughs> And that's what we stare at at breakfast every single day. Every photo of our backyard, the backdrop, is really colorful and really fun. Um, but we love our home. And we have fostered and adopted our youngest, Moses, in this home, who is the baby brother to our girls. And so it's just been a, just a special place for the last four years. Now, I also will say there has been a lot of gun violence in the neighborhood. And it's been rampant over the last couple of weeks. But again, we feel like where we are positioned is to be people who are present and people of peace and people who pray. Now, those aren't even the points I'm going to talk about, but feel free to write those down if you want to apply this to your own living situation. But you may have never thought about the place that you live as being spiritual. The last couple of moves for us have been a really huge part of our spiritual journey and this is our story, right? We all have stories about where we've lived or the neighborhoods that we've chosen to live in or maybe the neighborhood we're headed to, the one that we can't wait to get to. And whether you're discontent, maybe you're in your dream home, but we all have this thing in common that we have a place to lay our head at night, right? Well, a few weeks ago, I was talking with a girlfriend of mine and we were just having a conversation over Chipotle about what God's doing in our life and how we want to start out the year. 
And she shared a three-word phrase with me that day that just haunted me. It was just with me all that next day, the next week, just week after week. It just started to just become a phrase that I said around the house to my husband, to our kids often. And the phrase is simply, here is holy. And if you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write that down. Here is holy. When you walked in, there was paper and pencils you were given. Please feel free to write notes on one side. We are going to use the back side for something at the end. The definition of here is the immediate present. It's everything that's going on in life right now. The definition of holy is dedicated or consecrated to God. It's sacred. So the immediate present here is sacred or it's holy. Now here is not just a physical location like the neighborhood that you live in or the home that you've chosen to live in. Here isn't whether you've chosen to be suburban or urban. Here could be a relationship. Here could be your family. It could be a season, maybe a financial status, maybe your platform or your job. The place that I'm at here, age 41 in 2022, is holy. My 19th year of marriage with Paul is holy. Walking my daughter through her high school years and talking about college is holy. Attending my son's middle school races and carpooling young boys and girls to practice is holy. Staying up at night with our daughters reading chapter books before bed is holy. Learning to co-regulate and identify my own triggers with our two-year-old who is in a state of just rages and tantrums right now, that's holy. Everything that God has given me right here is holy. Everything that God has given you right here is holy. After we adopted Moses last July, we decided, you know what? Our family feels full. We're going to stop and close our license at this point. And at that time, I remember thinking, okay, well, if we're done with this, like, God, what's next? What, what's going to be my next big thing that you want me to jump into? Right? I was kind of ready. We did seven years of foster care. Like, now what? And sometimes I just want to fast forward. I want to take the steps. I want to do the formula just so I can get to there. And I miss the sacredness of here. I get distracted and I take my eyes off of here. I can focus so much on everything that I want things to be, how I want things to be for my family, that I miss the beautiful purpose that God has right now. Well, over several months, honestly, of this agitation, I just remember one day I was just praying about it, like, God, what do you have and the answer that day was so simple and almost sarcastic. Can God be sarcastic? I think he can be kind of sarcastic at times, depending on your personality. But for me, I can be sarcastic. And I feel like the Lord just said, um, your big thing is your marriage. Your big thing, your five kids. And it, even though it was so simple, I was like, huh, yeah, you're right. I don't need to pursue anything else. My plate is full. God, there is so much. My kids are in. If any of you have ever had a high schooler, a middle schooler, two elementary students, and one still in pull-ups, let me tell you, life is full. And God was just challenging me like, this is your thing. This is holy work. Don't get distracted. Be aware. Be open to see all that I have for your beautiful family right here. We often spend so much time thinking about what life will look like there. Like when this pandemic is over, God, then I'm going to work on my marriage. Then I'm going to spend time with my kids. Or then I'm going to grow spiritually. Or then I, I promise I'll join that small group. Or I'll start spending more time with my friends or my roommate, prioritizing relationships. It's always once I get there. Instead of, man, there are opportunities right here. Hmm. Or how, I bet, how about when I get there, then what I do will really matter. 
then what I do will really make a difference, will really be remembered there. When we get the next house, well, when we get the next car, or when we go on that next vacation, or when I get that next job, or that next upgrade, or that next promotion, it's there. But God is saying, here, here is holy. We have our bigs and we have our littles, like I mentioned. And, you know, when you're a big kid, when you're middle school and high school, you get to do things that the little ones don't get to do, like stay up late, right? So our little girl, Winnie, she's now six. When she was three, she would always walk around the house really disgruntled. When the big kids got to do stuff, she didn't get to do. So she would say things like, when I'm big, I'm going to go to bed any time I want. When I'm big, I'm going to eat ice cream for breakfast. And she just would let us know, like, hey, this isn't fair, what y'all are doing to me. But when I'm big, I'm going to make my own decisions. And it's funny, but isn't that our human nature, even as adults? We'd be like, well, God, when I get there, when I get to that place, things are going to be better for me. And God is saying, no, 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 no. Here, right here, is holy. We also like to dwell on what was back then. God, life was easier then. I was appreciated then. I liked my life better then. And God is saying, hey, I brought you out of that place for a reason. You are here now. Here is holy. Now, this same little girl of ours, Winnie, just turned six. And leading up to all the kids' birthdays, we count it down. Maybe you do the same thing in your home if you have children. But a month out, you say, you're going to be six in a month, or you're going to be six in just two weeks. And every time I would do that, she'd go stone cold, no motion. And she'd say, I don't want to turn six. I want to turn three. (laughs) And I wouldn't know what to do, so I would just keep celebrating like 24 hours. Let's see what she says this time. But to her, she's like, three's more fun. I didn't have to go to school when I was three. I got to stay home all day with mama when I was three. I got to play more, right? It's our human nature. We want things a certain way. I mean, if I'm honest, as an adult, there are thoughts that go through my head often, even if I don't always verbalize them. Man, if I didn't have so many kids, I could sit on a Saturday and read a novel for hours. It's been a long time since I've been able to do that, ladies. Long time. Well, if we didn't live in the city, then I'd be happier because I wouldn't hear gunfire week to week in my neighborhood. Or if I worked full time, then I'd feel validated because I'd actually have a title. Right? These are the things that go on in our minds and we can get so disgruntled or discontent right here. Or maybe for some of you, you're thinking, Well, if I could just save up more money, then I would be more generous. If my church functioned more like this, then I would get involved. If my husband and I actually got along, then maybe we considered serving or mentoring some younger couples. There's something about here that can agitate us. If we don't like the season we're in, if we come frustrated about here, or if we see other people thriving, we don't like our here very much. If we feel incompetent, we can even fear here. Get me out of here. God, I don't want to be here. I don't like it here. I wish I was there but we can't be prepared for what there has for us if we don't learn everything that God has for us right here. When we disengage, when we get distracted, we are dismissing the beautiful, incredible things that God wants to do here. On February 9th, this was just about nine days ago, it was 7 o'clock at night, and I was giving Moses a bath, and I got a call from a girlfriend of mine who I had just seen earlier that day, so I almost didn't answer, because I thought, oh, it's kind of crazy, bedtime is always a little nutso in our house, but I answered the phone, and she was crying, 
and she could hardly breathe, and she said, Candace, I, th I think a bullet just went through my front living room window. And she is a dear friend of mine, and she's also a neighbor that lives about a mile and a half away. And right away, when I got that call, I said, honey, just breathe. We're on our way. And I got Lola and Justice. They helped put their siblings to bed. And we went over there to sit with them, to be with them, to be with their kids. And it was about three to four hours that we just could pray. We turned on some worship music, tried to find the bullet. I mean, honestly, it was, it was such a surreal experience. And I remember being so at peace. I wasn't afraid. And I knew in that moment, God, our purpose tonight is to be people of peace, people who pray, and people who are present with our friends. Well, I came home that night, and I'll be honest, I was standing in the bathroom, and I'm looking at the mirror, and I started to get really angry, and I said, really, God? Here is holy? Here? When a bullet just went through my friend's window, that's holy? And I sat for just a few minutes in the bathroom, just anger, I had some tears surface, and I felt like in the moment God said, here's holy because I'm here. I have not left your friends. They were safe. I am here, so here is holy. And it's like any resentment, anger, or why, God, why, just melted away. And I said, okay, God, I trust you. I trust you for them. I trust you for our own family, for our safety. And I can't personally change my neighborhood. We feel very called there, so we're not up listing our home. But I was reminded of my purpose that night to pray, to be present, for some of you here, you're in a season that you might feel hopeless. You might be angry. You might come bitter tonight. There doesn't seem to be an end to the madness in front of you. And you're here may feel like anything but holy, but God is here. And if we are willing to sit here, there are three things that we can learn here. And if you're taking notes, please pull out your pencil or your phone. I like to do notes on my, on my phone. The first thing we can learn is that there is wisdom here if we are willing to ask for it. Well, there's wisdom here. James 1.5, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God because he gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I love that they added that part, without finding fault. It doesn't matter how close you feel to the Father tonight. It doesn't matter how far away you feel from the Father tonight. He is saying, I'm generous. I'm willing to give it to all who ask for it. Okay? God is faithful. His love is constant, and his wisdom is it could blow our minds, but we just need to ask. Any independent woman out there that just want to do it all and crush it all, and you find yourselves in seasons, you're like, oh, God, I cannot do it. I can't do it all, God. There was a lie that I believed last fall, and the lie was that God gave us five kids, but that he didn't give me the capacity to take care of them. And so I was angry with God. I was like, where are you at? I need help here. I'm struggling. And God was so gentle to say, I haven't left. I haven't abandoned you. I'm right here. Stop ordering books off Amazon to figure out your two-year-old. Talk to me. Ask me for wisdom because I got it. I have what you need. And there's nothing wrong with reading up on parenting, but... I knew that the Lord was saying, man, put me first. Ask me for the wisdom that you need for every stage that your children are at. Ask me for the wisdom that you need as you navigate the 19th year of your marriage with your husband in your 40s and five kids. Ask me for wisdom as you navigate how to be present 
in your neighborhood that is hurting. Number two, there is maturity here if we are willing to wait for it. There is maturity here. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it a sheer gift when tests and challenges come at you from all sides, because they will. You know that under pressure, your faith, fil- your faith life is forced right out into the open, and it shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Those are some powerful words. Don't try to rush to get to there. Don't try to fast forward because things are hard here. Let it do its work so that you can become fully developed women, not deficient. It doesn't just say not deficient in most ways. It says in any way. Some of you don't even realize that you have the capacity to be fully developed and mature and that God wants to just remind you how incredible that you are and what you have right here. Some of you just, you feel deficient constantly. You feel like you're always lacking, never enough. And God is saying, hey, I want to give you wisdom And I want to fully develop you into the women that I have created you to be. But do you trust him to do that? And if we will sit in it, there is so much growth that we can experience. The actual definition of maturity is someone who doesn't throw a temper tantrum when they don't get their way. How many have thrown a temper tantrum or two with the Lord? Be like, man, I don't like it here, God. What are you doing here? And God is saying, it's all right. I'm here. I'm here. And I want to teach you all that you need to know if you will just wait in this season, if you will be present here. A couple weeks ago, our younger son Moses was having one of his, um, we call it like a rage, where he's screaming and he's um, being aggressive with me. And I was trying all the, all the tools I knew to do. Paul had already taken all the girls to school, and they had all been home for a couple of weeks, so I knew this transition would be hard for him. They had been online learning. Now they were going back in person, and it was just myself, Moses, and my 13-year-old son, Justice. And literally, Moses is running behind the couch. I can't even get to him, and he is screaming at me, and I'm just standing in the middle of the living room like okay, just breathe, mama, just breathe. And my son, Justice, walks in the room, and he said, Moses, come here. And he walked right up to him. And Justice knelt down, and he put his hands on Moses' upper arms on both sides, and he said, Moses, I know you're angry. I know you're frustrated because we're all leaving you right now. But mama's going to stay with you all day. And tonight, we're all going to be home together again, so I need you to be nice to mom. He's 13. And right away, Moses went limp. He stopped screaming. He just leaned his head into his brother's shoulder. Justice rubbed his back. And I'm standing there in my bathrobe just crying. In the back, I'm like, what is happening? This is beautiful. And I knew, I'm like, how many times have I tried to shield my daughter Lola or my son Justice from these rages, trying to protect their emotions, thinking, oh, man, God, when we finally get out of the stage, things are going to be so much better. And I, if I do that, I miss the beauty of what I saw in my teenage boy who was learning kindness and empathy and how to calm a raging toddler. Those are things you can't just teach. You have to sit in the hard seasons for that kind of growth to come from it. And I was just so grateful, so grateful that I hadn't tried to rush us on or protect him. But as a family, we decided we're in this together. We're all going to have to do this together. So the first thing, there is wisdom here. Number two, there is maturity here. And number three, there is love here. If we are willing to receive it. Ladies, got some news for you. God is not going to love you more when you get there. 
He did not love you more back then. His love for you is so constant. It does not shift. It does not waver. It's not a roller coaster. It is steady. And there are three sub points, because I like to work in threes. So if you want to do A, B, C, however you want to do it, the first thing is if we receive love, if we are willing to receive it, we realize we are not alone here. You may be in this room and you feel lonely, but I assure you, you are not alone here. Romans 8.38 says, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. And it goes on to say, neither our fears for today here, nor our worries for tomorrow there. Nothing can separate us from his love. The second thing, if we receive love, there is no fear here. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. I was talking about our neighborhood, and you know, we live in this tension as a family between our purpose here and holding what's broken over here. It's both and. And the day after, we were with our friends who had the bullet go through their window. I was giving Moses a bath. Again, we do that a lot. And as I'm giving him a bath, I'm starting to think about and replay everything that happened the night before. And my breathing got really rapid. And I started crying. And I'm trying to still do the bath. And I'm kind of wailing at this point because Paul's downstairs and he comes up. He's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I said, I think I'm just really overwhelmed and it's all starting to come out about what happened last night. So he goes back downstairs. He was in a meeting. And just within a few minutes, those rapid breaths turned into a full-on panic attack. And it was the most debilitating experience of my life. I've had maybe a few over the last couple of years, usually surrounding foster care adoption. And in that moment, I wasn't able to move my hands, my arms, everything just locked up. And I was so exhausted after about a half an hour. And Paul, thank God he was home. He was with me. And I just crawled into bed. He took Moses. And I just put on worship music. And I said, whoa, God. What just happened? And there had been multiple things happening in our neighborhood leading up to that point. And I felt like the Lord was saying, just rest in me. My perfect love will drive out this fear. And I felt like it was just, I allowed fear to basically just kind of take hold of my mind and my body in that moment. I was so scared for my family. I was so scared for our friends, scared for our neighborhood. And I just, just succumbed to this panic attack. And it was such a humbling experience, but such a powerful reminder to me that God is here. God did not leave us. God is faithful. He loves us, and his love, if I would receive it that day, would drive out the fear. And I truly can tell you that he did because following that day, it was actually later that afternoon, a young man, a 15-year-old in our neighborhood, was shot and killed, and he was the star quarterback at our local high school. And the next day, two men were murdered five blocks from our home in a car. So there were plenty more opportunities for me to succumb to fear. And I knew because of the peace that I had that God had reminded me, okay, we have purpose here, Lord, to be people of peace, to be people who pray and people who are present. God, be with our neighborhood. And I was able to intercede in a way that I'm not able to do when I am fearful. And I had hard conversations with my husband. What are we doing here? Are we foolish for being here? Some very raw conversations. And he kept responding with questions, just getting me to think, just getting me to think, letting me say what I needed to say. And by the end of that night, I remember being so at peace. I mean, like, God, you are here and you are with us. The last one. So if we receive love, we realize we're not alone. 
There's no fear here. And the third one, if we receive love, we will give love here. 1 John 4 verse 19 says, The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If we're struggling to receive love, we don't have the capacity to give love. And sometimes when we're hurting the most, when we're the most vulnerable here, God is saying, if you receive my love and if you trust me, there's so much I want to do through you even in your pain. Even in one of the worst seasons of this neighborhood in the last four years that you've lived there, there's so much that I want to do through you. I remember even sharing these few things with Amber just a few days ago, and she's like, Candace, do you even want to come? Like, it's okay, you can stay home. And I was like, nope, nope, because exactly what I knew I'd be speaking on here has been the exact words that I've needed in my own heart this last week. I've been praying for you women over the last month or so, and I remember One night, just a week or so ago, I was praying. I was like, God, would you just wake me up when you want me to get up tomorrow? Because sometimes I'll set an alarm. And I was tired. It was late. And I was kind of hoping, like, maybe don't wake me up, and I'll just get up when the kids get up. But I still prayed. I'm like, God, I've done this a handful of times in the past. Just just wake me up when you want me to wake up. And at 4.30 in the morning, my daughter Nia was having a bad dream. So I rushed in there, and I'm rubbing her back, and I'm just whispering her in her ear, And I felt like the Lord said, it's time to get up. And I was like, no, you got to be kidding. No, it's 430. And I just kept rubbing her back. And I felt like the Lord said, do you trust me? Do you trust me to speak to you at this hour? And I just thought, okay. I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm going to fall back to sleep. So sure. And I just went to bed. I sat up. I pulled out my phone. And I went to my Bible app. And I do a daily reading plan. So I just pulled it up. And I'll be honest, I was only doing this out of discipline because I was in the book of Leviticus. And I had just finished all the animal sacrifices. And I I go through those kind of quick because they literally make me queasy. So I thought, all right, God, I am only reading this because I'm just going to, like, get out of the way for the day. And it was chapters 19 and 20 were my two verses for that day. And just to give you a quick one sentence here, in chapter 19, it's just... God giving instructions for the Israelites on how they should understand what it means to worship and how they should understand social laws and economic rules so that they could be holy before God. Okay, so the first two verses in chapter 19, God spoke to Moses, speak to the congregation of Israel and tell them, be holy because I, God, your God, am holy. So I kept reading to chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, and it said, Set yourselves apart for a holy life. Live a holy life because I am God. I'm your God. Do what I tell you. Live the way I tell you. I am the God who makes you holy. And then again in verse 26, it finishes with, Live holy lives before me because I, God, am holy. So I'll be honest, I'm laughing at this point. I'm like, God, you cracked me up. You got me up at this hour just to read Leviticus, just so that I could see a theme going on, right? I already knew what I was going to be talking about tonight. But in that moment, I felt like the Spirit was saying, be holy here, because here is holy When we first read these verses in Leviticus, it's this indicator of a transition that's happening. Okay, up to this point, everything the people knew was that God resided in a physical place. It was called the tabernacle. And God gave them instructions on how to build it. Think like a church building. All right, and just this one room called the Holy of Holies, that's where God's presence resided. So up to this point, they thought the only way to be holy or to access holiness was going inside this tabernacle. So this is the first time they're also hearing that as individuals, they themselves can be holy. So God's communicating, hey, it's no longer just a place, but it's in you. 
And God was calling them to act holy, to be holy, to live holy lives, which is kind of what we know and understand when we read the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So everywhere we go, the Holy Spirit is with us, right, and residing in us. And for you ladies that are here tonight, holy is not just when you walk in this church building. Holy is not just your pastors. It's not even a physical space like your home. When God says, be holy, he is talking to every one of us. And if we go back to the definition in the beginning, be holy, be dedicated to God. Look at your lives and your bodies as sacred. Your spirits as sacred. Be holy here. Because here is holy. Where God has every one of us here is exactly where he wants you to be. There's more passion here. There's more purpose here. And there's so much preparation here if we are willing to sit in it. Well, the purpose tonight wasn't just for you all to come and just have a good time together, although I really hope you are. But my prayer for you, the prayer of Amber and her team, is that you would also walk away challenged tonight, that you would spend some time praying, looking at your own lives, taking a pause, say, God, what is it that you're doing in me? How does this apply to me? And there's a couple questions we're going to close with, and we're going to put them up on the screen. And the first one is, what does here look like for me? And the second is, what is distracting me? from here. So that first question, I spent a little bit of time, I took out a notebook, and I wrote some things down. And I'm not going to read all of them to you, but a few of them were, for me, what does here look like? Here is mentoring young couples who are new to marriage. Here is sitting with my son in a tantrum and calming my own breathing before I can help calm his. Here is staying in hard conversations with my husband and not walking away when I don't like the direction they're going. Here is discipling our kids. These are just some things. My husband had three. I think I was up to like 50 within a 20 minute period. So we're gonna take a little time for you to write on the back of that sheet or in your phone and just write down, what does your hear look like? Now, this may be a hard question for some of you because as I mentioned before, you don't like where you're at here, but I think it's important that we write it down. I can honestly say over the last month since I've been writing this, my husband and I have exchanged looks in our home on multiple occasions and just said, here's holy. When the kids are screaming, when it feels like it's just so chaotic, we can't even sit or have a conversation, we just laugh and we go, here's holy. All right, Lord, here's holy. And so my prayer for you is that tonight as you sit and start writing, just write, as things come to mind, just get it out. Just start writing it, the good things, the things that you love about your here, and the things that are really hard about here, write those down too. And then your second question, what is distracting me from here? Is it a toxic relationship? Is it an addiction? Is it social media? Is it discontentment? Is it control? What are the things that are keeping me from being fully present here? We're gonna close in prayer and as the worship team sings, I'd like you to take a little time and then Amber will come up and close. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to be together tonight. I pray that as every woman just sits and pauses for a few minutes to think about where her here is, that you would enlighten her, that you would speak to her, that you would just be present with her, even in writing those things that are difficult to put on paper or put in her phone, that she would just be honest about her here and just be reminded that here is holy. And that in writing these things out, you would give each one a sense 
of their purpose here, of the preparations you have for them here, of the beauty that is here. God, we love you. We just thank you for this time. We pray that we would not try to rush to get out of here because it's uncomfortable, but that we could sit and our bodies and our minds would be at peace in this room. In Jesus' name, amen.